Our goal, especially as we have been studying the book of Colossians, is to truly behold him. Because when we behold him, everything else becomes secondary and everything else makes more sense. And we need that in a broken world, and we do live in a broken world. If you don't know that, look around you more carefully. For Paul, as he wrote this book, he's in jail. He knows in his own life the failure of religion. He had persecuted Christians. He looked forward to, or at the very least, what was coming for those in Colossae, not only persecution, but also an earthquake would shatter that city and leave it devastated, never to be rebuilt. And there is a brokenness in life that impacts us all, not only in terms of what we have discussed, but personally, we, we get older. Health issues, relational issues, people around us not treating us necessarily as we would desire, and it is good to be aware, which I suppose is obvious, that we live in a broken world. Now, the world around us that we swim in realizes this as well, and so one of the obvious worldview questions that everyone is asking is, why are we broken, how do we fix it, and where are we going? Answers to those questions will then shape how you see life, how you respond to life, and I hope how you live it. Now, sadly, for those of us in the church who seek to be driven and defined by our relationship with Jesus, who seek to be biblical in our understanding of life, and perhaps even as important, the overflow of that and living our life according to the word of God, is sometimes it is very difficult. We live in a world that is not friendly with the Bible, that seeks to change how we think about different areas of life. In fact, I might even argue all of life, and I think that is why God would state so clearly, if you want to be a friend of the world, you'll be an enemy of God. There's a a way of thinking that dominates those who are in the sphere of the world, that if we don't learn from God's word to shape and to think differently, to shift our thinking differently and align it with the Bible, we will end up in chaos and brokenness. One of the main attacks of the world is on the family and how to think about the family. And it so inundates the world that often those in the church apologize for what the Bible says about family and the differences between men and women, husband and wife, children, and what to do in the workplace. If you have your Bibles with you, and I hope that you do, if you could open them with me to Colossians chapter 3, where we carry on this fascinating study of how to make sure that Jesus is all and in all. We come to a passage now that I was at a, a conference, a TGC conference. I was speaking at it, and one of the speakers got up to speak on this very passage, and before they started, they apologized for what it was going to say. That was horrifying. I rebuked that speaker passionately and told him he should never do it again, and then I promised myself that I never would. Because God's Word is there from Him, for Him, and for our good. And when we come to passages like this that are shocking to us, and it is shocking, some of the words are seen in our culture as almost blasphemous. When we come to a passage like this, if we truly align ourselves with God and seek to live for God, then we should rejoice in his goodness of giving us passages like this. Now, the context is, as ever, important. We've seen that we're to be those who are seeking and setting, constantly seeking and setting our eyes, our minds, our thoughts, our hearts, everything on on Jesus. He he is to be the all-definer of our lives, our relationships, of everything. Our our key goal is to serve him and, and to delight in him and to know him well. We've seen that to do that, we we must kill sin in our lives. We must take off the 
clothing that is soiled by the world and the flesh and the devil and replace it with what God wants us to be like as we're found, our, our chief identity, our everything in Christ. If Jesus is to be supreme, if we're to have his peace ruling in our hearts, if we're to be permeated with his word, if we're to have a a passion to do everything in his name, it must not only impact our religious lives, it must impact everything about us. If you remember in verse 17 of the text we've already covered, it, it's this idea of whatever we do, it, it's this all-encompassing, all of the time, always doing things in the name of the Lord Jesus, always aligning ourselves with his character, always longing to glorify him, always being radically Christ-centered. If we go to the next verses, which we're going to cover today, without that understanding, without open hands and open hearts, without a grasp of the goodness of God, the glory of the gospel, the surrender our lives to him, then these verses will be an affront to our own lives, even as they are an affront to our culture. So let me say that I believe these are wonderful, powerful verses that I am privileged to preach on to you. And as I rebuke the preacher myself, if you didn't figure that out, who preached at that conference in Atlantic Canada for the Gospel Coalition, as I look back to that, I understand that if we truly believe what God teaches and who God is, then these verses are one that if we choose, ones that if we choose to obey, will be good for us and the glory of God will be shaping us to be like him. If you find these verses difficult, may I strongly recommend that you spend time in the earlier chapters and verses. Align your heart with God that he is real and that he is relevant and that he has revealed himself to us and then these verses will become as precious to you as they are to me. Start at verse 17, although we'll be covering the later verses. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. As we read this, I want you to notice seven times the lordship of Jesus comes up. This this is a passage that emphasizes, among other things, that all of our lives, especially our lives that have lived in community, are to be done so in radical submission to the lordship of Jesus. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged, bond servants or slaves. Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service, not just when they're watching you or you know you're being watched as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, a heart fully devoted to God, exclusively devoted to Jesus, fearing the Lord. Verse 23, probably summarizing everything we've covered, but for sure what we're doing in the workplace Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. In other words, he's not only real and noticing what we're doing, but responds to that with reward. How you live for him at home and at work matters and actually will impact your rewards in eternity. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. These are shocking verses. And as we come to them, we do so longing to understand and obey them because we belong to Jesus, because he is our Lord. We, we want to obey him in the home, and we want to obey him in the workplace. And where the Bible conflicts with culture, the Bible is right. Where God gives his best view for fulfillment in the family or the workplace, God is always right, and it's always best for us. 
And I think we would notice this if we just stepped back and evaluated the world around us, maybe 50 years ago, maybe now, and, and said, where is the fulfillment that comes in marriages? And we'd look around and we'd say, everything's falling apart, or where's the fulfillment that's to come from work? And we could also, I think, argue everything seems to be falling apart. And, and so this passage in the context of Colossians for the supremacy of Christ where Jesus is all and in all is for us to understand how to live this out in submission to his lordship in every area of our lives. And the emphasis now being very particular, very application oriented happens to be in family, what happens in your household, and then in community, what happens when you go to work. Really, what would have been dominating the lives of those that the Apostle Paul is writing to. I suppose we could just say, be dominated by your relationship with Jesus. Make sure that everything you do is from him and for him. But now it messes with our understanding of marriage and our understanding of life. And so again, we need to do this in the context of our understanding of the glory of the gospel, the goodness of God, and the wonder of his revelation to us about his role's for us. Submission to Jesus is always best and obvious for those who belong to him. I suppose seven times Jesus is Lord. So start with, with all of that said, family God's way. Family God's way. This is where the relationship you have with Jesus should be displayed perhaps most profoundly because usually what happens behind closed doors is not something that others will be aware of. And Jesus wants us to be so dominated by our relationship with him that behind those closed doors, we display the beauty and power of what he desires from us. And, and verses 18 to 21 puts that on display. He's going to talk to wives and then to husbands and then to children and then to fathers. So there's this kind of fourfold, I think relatively simple to understand, presentation of the different roles that we have in the home. Wives, he starts with. I'll read the whole thing and then come back and look at kind of the process of which he goes through in the order he goes through. You know, when I was teaching in Ephesians, I changed the order because, again, it's so hard to hear these things in our culture. But I think I'll just trust that God's order is the right one and give it to you in his order. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Here's how to live out the lordship of Jesus in your home. Wives, submit to your husbands. That's kind of hard because in our generation, we almost hear the word submission as something that's abusive even to use, and even marriage has become something that many are making fun of, and most have lost sight of what a biblical definition of marriage actually is. And in the brokenness of our lives, there are so many children that wonder if marriage is even for them, and so many in the culture that are moving away from it. And there's a seven-year-old girl, one pastor tells this story, who was watching a movie, a, a Disney movie, Cinderella, and was testing her neighbor lady's knowledge of the story, and the neighbor was trying to impress a little girl. She knew the story well, and so they're interacting back and forth, and the neighbor lady said, well, I know what happens at the end. The little girl said, well, what happens at the end? And the lady, the neighbor lady said, well, Cinderella and the prince live happily ever after, and the girl answered, oh, no, they didn't. They got married. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, marriage is a beautiful gift from God, Ephesians 5 makes this profoundly clear that is given to us not, not for our fulfillment, although in a secondary way it certainly does that, but is given to display the beauty of Christ in the church. And the role of wives in that is to display the beauty of the church in response to Christ, and that includes at the very heart of what it means, this willingness to surrender, to to place oneself under in terms of a voluntary yielding in love. Literally, the term is a lineup under. It's a military term. It's this voluntary, this surrender to say, I will submit to my husband, my own husband. Notice that. A lot of pastors take a lot of time to explain 
It's not all husbands. I don't know that we need to do that. I think it's kind of obvious in the text. Literally, place yourself under. Ephesians 5, again, that picture. As a church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands. Ephesians 5, the sister letter, also written about the same time from the same prison cell. He adds, in everything. Now, again, as a culture, it kind of takes our breath away because we, we think like the world. We swim in the world, and submission for us, although all of us do it, has almost become a secondary role, and we don't understand the glory of the submission of Christ to the Father or the wonder of submission of everyone to the Lordship of Jesus or the beauty of what this is to display. So I, I want to ask some questions about this. First, just what is this submission? Let's look at it. And, and I think we need to see, Philippians 2 and other places, that Jesus is the ultimate model of what submission actually is. Here's Philippians 2. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, something to be held on with, with both fists, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He understood God's plan for him. He willfully and joyfully accepted it. The joy set before him and chose to, in that, be submissive to God. So we understand submission is a willfully placing oneself under, a voluntary yielding in love. And it's something that we follow Christ in, all of us. Submission, secondly, does not make someone inferior. Let's fight against the world's view of that, although I don't really think the world believes it because there's submission all over the place. But a wife's ultimate obedience is in surrender to the lordship of Jesus, and she chooses in this to obey God, not man. She's not, if you go on in this passage, a people pleaser, not a husband pleaser, as it were, but a God pleaser. And so she chooses in surrender to the lordship of Jesus to say that I will willfully and joyfully place myself under the leadership of my husband. I will submit as is fitting in the Lord. It's, it's a relational command. It's, a, it's an overflow. And, and again, I, I will bring this caution, although carefully, because it's not clear in the text. Because it's clear that this is relational with Jesus, it's not dependent on the husband carrying out their role. We'll see the husband's role in just a minute. Also, not dependent on the wife carrying out her role. It's dependent on having a trust and love relationship with the living God of the Bible who notices and cares about everything. It's, it's dependent on understanding the purpose of marriage, which is to display the glory of the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah. It is to the Lord, and therefore, as God has revealed his word, the loyalty to God is first and always, and submission to a husband is an overflow of that. It's a relationship that is designed to picture something that transcends human relationships. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. I won't take a lot more time to explain it away or even to try to help you to understand it more other than to say, I think it's pretty clear what God's best is. Culture doesn't like it, I suppose, but culture is wrong. Secondly, in terms of this understanding of family, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Husbands, love your wives. If we were to take this to the sister book, Ephesians, we'd see that this call is for husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Again, not dependent on a perfect wife who submits and not demanding submission from their wife. This is rather the opportunity to say, I want to be like Christ in self-sacrificial choosing of God's best for the one he has entrusted to my care, my, my leadership. I will self-sacrificially choose that for the one that God has entrusted to me. Let's just ask a very simple question. The word love here, it's active, it's continual, it's selfless. What, what did Jesus do? For the church. Well, interestingly enough, and I want to say this very carefully, 
he was willing to lay aside his own desires. Now, again, some people might come back to me and say, well, his greatest desire was to do the will of the Father. They'd be correct. But I want to take you to the Garden of Gethsemane and see Jesus understanding the greatness of his sacrifice, saying, nevertheless, not what I will, but you will, being willing to go all the way for the church to bring about forgiveness and freedom and eternal life. Oh, the love of Jesus. Not what he desired, not, not what those he loved desired. What did Peter want? Well, Peter didn't want him to suffer, that's for sure. Remember Matthew 16 when Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan? The other disciples all wanting him to rule now. The people as he came into Jerusalem, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Salvation has come. Salvation has come. Salvation from what? They, they wanted something temporary, something now. Salvation from the Romans. Oh, give us health and wealth now. Jesus had something far more profound. He was willing to suffer pain for their good. Not what they wanted. Not what he wanted. I want to say that very carefully because of course he wanted the will of God and of course he willfully went to the cross. But he chose the pathway that was best for them. Husbands, you can go to a place like this and I think that the church has abused this in the past. Christians in the culture, like the culture, have abused this in the past. We should never, I'll speak now as a husband, never demand submission until we are perfectly loving as Christ loved the church. How many of us attain that? The answer? None. See, this is not about demanding, it's about offering. This is, this is not about my desire for you to be better for me, but my desire to honor Jesus as Lord in everything. Now, it's interesting, it doesn't just end with this love that I'm to have for my wife, Lori, or if you're married, or if you're modeling this, but also, do not be harsh with them. What does this mean? Well, in leadership, you have choices to make, and in those choices, not only is there to be this tenderness of self-sacrificial love, of, of moving towards God's best for those that are in your care, but there's to be done in a way that is gentle. In Ephesians 5, they use the word cherish, this Warm blanket. Oh, oh, I will tell you this as someone who confesses this often to my own family. I long to be this. And I am miles from it. I want to love Lori as Christ loved the church. I, I want to be one who is leading and honoring her and honoring God and treasuring her. And in every breath I take, choosing to die to self, to die to what she wants and to choose God's best for all of us. I, I long to be doing it with a gentleness that just is exhuming from my personality that she always feels covered by a warm blanket. And I'm moving in that direction. I'm getting better year by year, but I got a long ways to go. And by the way, so does the husband sitting next to you. Don't be too hard on me. See, brothers and sisters, what God is doing is giving us this picture of what we're to pursue to be like Jesus and to be like the church and to, to move forward that we might model this to the world around us that is so messed up and takes advantage of women and puts down men or if you go back that abuses women and almost makes this kind of exclusive personhood for men. Whatever the culture we're in is demanding, and this just explodes that. So if you're a husband here, listen carefully. Your role is not to demand things of your wife, but to display the self-sacrificial love of Jesus to her, to cherish her, to be gentle with her. If you're a wife here, your, your, your responsibility is not to say to your husband, man, if you love me right, then I'll respond right. Your job is not, not to say, boy, once you get that loving me and cherishing me and being gentle with me, which you are so far from, once you, once you get that right, I'll submit to you. Rather, you're to say, both of you are to say, and if you're choosing marriage God's way, you're all to say... I submit to the lordship of Jesus. I choose his way. Therefore, I will submit. Therefore, I will love as Jesus loved, and I will treat with gentleness, not harshness. This is a gospel issue. This 
is a lordship issue. It goes in the home from marriage to parenting, although it's interesting in verse 21, he says, fathers, fathers, do not provoke your children. I'm going to jump ahead and then come back. Do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Well, what are the children to do? Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Submission to the Lordship of Jesus. See, we have this now relationship where the parents are to give guidance to the children, model the gospel to them in their marriage, and then choose obedience Choose a pathway of obedience where the children are saying, I want to honor Jesus. I love Jesus. Therefore, I will choose to obey my parents. That's difficult in this current culture. In fact, in many ways, the culture is trying to remove the authority of the parents and replace it with the authority of the state or the medical system. And that is horrific. Here, parents are seeking to honor God. Here, parents are saying, I I want to please the Lord, and so I'm going to choose to disciple and mentor and discipline my children so that they honor and please God. And children, if you're a child here, which covers all of us, I suppose if your parents are no longer with us, you can kind of take a little bit of a brain break. But for all of us, there's a sense that we want to honor them. Now, yes, there's a difference when you're at home to when you have your own home, but there should always be this desire to honor and to listen and to carefully be a part of this kind of household. Fathers, do not provoke your children. I think some scholars would say it's not just means fathers, it's parents. I actually think he does this on purpose. Because I think fathers, I would certainly include mothers in here as well, but I think fathers sometimes have a tendency to over-discipline or allow their own frailties or their own dreams to cloud how they choose God's best for their children. And here's this idea that fathers are to choose God's best not only in leading their wives but also now in leading their homes so that the children are set up to flourish and to be free in Christ. And the discipline and delight that you have in your children is not because of what they do for you but because together you're seeking to bring honor and glory to Jesus. This is not easy 50 years ago or today. This is not easy because we swim in a culture that demands freedom for children and children are even suing for freedom from their parents. This is not easy because husbands are demanding rights and freedoms or lackadaisically stepping away from leadership and just playing video games and having fun. And wives are demanding equality in terms of role and sameness is what they mean rather than choosing God's best. But this is not new. This is as old as when this was delivered. So again, my plead with you in terms of the family is to choose God's best because it is best. But perhaps if you can't even grasp that, choose it because he's Lord. Seven times in this passage. So I think it's best because God says it's best. I suppose I'd state that stronger. It is best because God says it's best. But if you can't handle that right now because you're swimming so strongly in the world and so fearful of being taken advantage of as a man or a woman or a child, then let me call you, plead with you, to submit to the lordship of Jesus. Now, if you thought that was difficult, it gets even more difficult. Family for God's glory now, work for God's glory. Pick it up in verse 22. Bond servants, if you have some translations, slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. There is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Was that too quick? This, we could spend a lot of time explaining how slavery was different Then, a full half of people were slaves, they tell us, in the Roman Empire, 60 million or so of them. We could talk about the fact that sometimes it was much better to be a slave than to be someone who was free. You were treated better. It was a part of their economic system. I think we we spent a lot of time doing that because we're trying to defend the Bible against what was known as modern slavery. So let me say up front, this is radically different than what you think of when you think of slavery. 
In fact, much more, although not as tightly as I would like. This is probably in terms of at least our application, but I would even say in terms of what it meant at the time, talking more about how to work, how, how to earn money, how, how to be a part of what's going on in society in public to, to be able to feed yourself and your family, perhaps. It's, it's talking about that kind of relationship. So I want to first of all say that all slavery, as we understand it, is evil, and I believe in the greater context of the Bible, especially as we understand it from a North American perspective, or child slavery, or so many other things that are going on now, it is evil and should be condemned, rightly condemned, and the Bible condemns it. I don't want to take the time to show that to you. I want to preach from this passage in a way that will make you feel awkward in a different way. This passage is going to say, as you work as an employee, or as you're a boss, your ultimate priority is not to make money, it's not to make sure your rights are taken care of, it, it's not to, to go in there selfishly in any way, shape, or form, but it's to literally open your hands, give up all of your rights, then say, I am here for the glory of God. Now that shouldn't surprise us, because it's what the whole Bible teaches, Right? Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. I mean, that's the context of this passage. But now it's getting so personal, and I, I don't want to get caught up in the slavery stuff so that we miss what it's actually teaching to us. It's saying if you're an employee, don't just serve as a people pleaser. Don't just serve when the employer's eyes are on you, but honor Jesus as you serve. In fact, even stronger... Jesus is your boss. You represent him when you're working there. Ultimately, you're not working for a paycheck. You're working for his glory. Now, that is breathtaking. Because we live in a society that says, make sure your rights are looked after. Make sure if it's not fair from your perspective or just from your perspective, make sure you fight for what is yours and your rights. This is saying so clearly God notices. God is the one you serve. Fear him. Live life as though God exists because he does. He is real. He is relevant. And he's revealed in his word what he wants for us. And this is saying to those of us who are working, open your hands and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. And then serve him wherever he has placed you. Again, I want to get very practical because I think this text does. This means that Christians should be the very best employees that are out there. I sometimes hear from people that they would rather hire a non-Christian than a Christian, and I say, God forbid. Because as Christians, we should have such integrity and such little thought of self and such full devotion to Jesus that in every moment we are living, in every moment we are working, and I know this is ideal, but this is what we long for. We are saying, I'm doing this for you, Jesus. And so when the employer entrusts us with something, we don't look at it as, wow, I'm thankful that the employer trusted me with that. We say, oh God, let me honor you with how I respond. Or if the Employer's not watching. We say, but God is, and I fear him. This idea of fear, this reverence, this understanding that God brings his recompense with him, this understanding of who he is and his character. Workers choose to respond to God in your work. He doesn't just leave it with workers. He talks about masters or employers as well. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. In other words, there's a great equality in Christ. This saying, be fair, be the best employer possible. Look after people, keep their dignity in mind. Make sure that everything you do is done in surrender to the lordship of Jesus so that you're almost treating your employees as though Jesus was your employee. See, see, what happens when you truly understand the book of Colossians is everything shifts. A lot of scholars say, well, this is just a, a simple Christian household kind of understanding. A, a household, as it were, kind of gift to us to, to explain this grasp of how we're to respond in life, in our homes, and in the communities. And I say, absolutely, that's correct. But it's so radically different from some of those that were in the same generation that we need to say that God is giving this to us to help us to know how to live and surrender to his lordship. If the gospel is real, and it is, 
If Jesus notices us and his Lord, and he is, notice seven times in this passage, the lordship of Jesus on display, then this is how we are to live in our homes and in our workplace and for our employees. And there's a faith here. You notice that. There's a, there's a trust here that says, God, you will look after everything. My job is to keep my eyes on you. You reward and you will look after. If I'm mistreated, you will take care of that. Full trust. Full surrender. Jesus is Lord. Everywhere. So how do we apply something like this? I, I know it messes with us a little bit and... I think it has to because we are in the world, but not of the world, or at least I hope we're seeking not to be of the world. Uh, So often, again, the river of the world is impacting the church, and we need to hear the word of God so that we're free from it. So first, and simply walk by faith, or what I mean by that is let's hear the word of God as the word of God. It's not suggestions for us. Commands to be obeyed. Jesus is Lord. Yes, he's our friend. I think that's a fair thing, but... The only time we're allowed to acknowledge his friendship, greater love is no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Jesus is Lord. Walk by faith. Truly believe that he is real and that his word is relevant. Truly align yourself with him and say, God, I'm going to choose to obey you even if my wife isn't doing everything that I believe she should or my husband isn't doing everything that he should or my parents or my workplace or you you fill in the blanks as perhaps the world is demanding you to stand up for what you think you deserve trust that god notices trust that he cares trust that he is good walk by faith secondly be word saturated it's essential that we understand not only these passages but the context of them and when is it okay to say no and all of those things and how should we stand up? Let's make sure that we're a people that not only preaches the word and listens to the word and aligns with the word but is constantly seeking to become more and more understanding of what this teaches so that we align here and not with the culture around us. There is an extreme danger. If, if I could just shout out maybe the, the greatest danger for the Canadian church that is trying to align with the Bible is that we're swimming in the world so passionately. We're, we're caught up in social media and watching television and all these things inundating us that we're being more trained by the world than the word. And so these words shock us. And rather than surrender, we try to figure out ways to avoid them. Be word saturated so that when God commands, your only response is a joyful Yes. Thirdly, know who you are in Christ. We, we said that's really the passion of Colossians chapter 3, but, but have your identity so secure and, and so right there that you don't get it from being the perfect father or the perfect husband or the perfect wife or the perfect employee or the perfect employer because we will fail in all of these. When you fail, remember your righteousness comes from Jesus and the motive you get to serve him and to open your hands and give up all of your rights and to fully surrender, all of that comes from him. So the obvious overflow of those things, that walking by faith, that word saturation, that knowing who you are in Christ, is to always choose obedience at personal cost. To say it in a positive way, be driven and defined by your relationship with Jesus. Our our time is short. We have an opportunity to impact others. If Jesus is your Lord, Show it in your home. Show it in how you work. Show it in how you're a boss. Spend less time demanding that people give you what you think you deserve and more time delighting in his goodness, his provision, and his plan to have you picture who he is by how your marriages are, by how your families are, and by how you represent him at work. Jesus is Lord. Obey him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Even passages like this that go so against what is in the world around us help us to choose to surrender to you fully and to find in that the goodness of what you have promised, the delight of knowing that your plan is best, and In that, help us to walk by faith. God, forgive us for when we 
make commands conditional on our own opinions and cause us to surrender fully to the lordship of Jesus. Help us to see men and women as equal in value, dignity. Help us to see the different roles you have for us. And delight in them as good. Help us to value children. Fight against a culture that is killing them and devaluing them. And help us to be those in the workplace that represent you so well that your name would be known, your fame displayed because we have chosen to walk with your character. God, help us in the power of your spirit. Give us a passion for your glory and conformity to Christ. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen.